everyone. Welcome to the COVID Calls. I am your host, Ryan Pyle, and this is my Instagram live. And today on the show, I have Mo Botha, and I had a chat with him last week, and we had such a good time. Uh, we decided, hey, let's get back on and do it again. Uh, look, today marks a very important day. Uh, it is June 21st. It is a Sunday, so it is Father's Day for anyone out there. And uh, I need to remember to uh, call my father this evening. And also, today marks the third month that I have been here in Istanbul. That's right. I arrived on March 21st, uh, and it is now June 21st. So I have been in the, I have been here for three months, and I was very unexpected. And uh, and here we are. Yeah. And uh, oh, thank you for the love from India, Praveen, Praveen. Thank you very much. Awesome. Um, look, are you guys enjoying these uh, COVID calls? I mean, how how are they going for you? Um, are they worthwhile? Yes, whiskey is about 2.5 months now uh, old. And uh, yeah, so three months in Istanbul. I'm still doing well. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. And let's bring in Mo and get this show on. The road. And uh, yeah, I think this is like my 73rd COVID call. So keep it. Hey, man, how you doing? Hi, Ryan. Very good to show. Thank you for uh, joining me yet again. No, it was good to be on you. Thank you for having me. No worries. No worries. So happy Father's Day. I know you've got a few. Yeah. How many, how many kids do you have? Uh, two boys. And, and what are their ages? Uh, six. And the other one is two next month. Okay. Wow. So have you got the two-year-old already learning how to scrum and... Uh... <laughs> And catch, mm. uh, catching a little bit, yeah, yeah, that's good. That's, that's good. Great. That's awesome. Um, so, how's everything in the UK at the moment? I mean, we'll get into we'll get into a little bit more rugby and your outdoors life and stuff like that. But yeah. how's everything in your part of the world at the moment? Yeah, not too bad. It's um, it's uh, slowly progressing. Um, sort of, you know, more and more people are getting out and about and um sort of getting back to normal in a way um so bars and restaurants are are, are, are reopening if they have out, outside space so they can serve people outside um so there's a bit of norm normality um coming back in so you know yeah it's nice it's nice you know you can go to the pub now and go go out for for a drink while sitting outside and you know with social distancing and stuff like that so so it's nice to have a bit of normality back. Yeah. So are you are you someone that likes to go to the pub? Is that something you like to do? I mean, because isn't sports a big part of like going to the pub? Like, don't you need to go down to the pub to watch some rugby or watch a football match or something, a European football match? Like, isn't that part of the fun? I mean, yeah. and with all the and with all the leagues shut down, I mean, you just go into the pub to drink. Yeah. Well. Um... <laughs> I think I think there's definitely uh, one side of it that's definitely uh, people go to watch sports, right. but um, it's it's very much part of the Eng English culture to you know once or twice a week go go down to the pub for for a few a few a few um, pints or a few beers in the evening, um, and you know especially the, the sort of everyone's got the the local pub and they go down and have a have a few drinks uh, once or twice a week, um, and you know you see all the regulars and you know everyone knows each other in the pub so that's very much part of uh british life and all that's been stopped for the last three months yeah yeah completely um it's uh, so you know some people found it really hard but um like i said it's nice to to get some normality back that's interesting that's interesting so i mean i drink alcohol and for everyone out there please drink responsibly but for me my my alcohol is consumed in the evening by myself while I'm normally like working or searching things to do or trips I want to take or, you know, episodes that I'm trying to create. So it's very much for me more of a an insulated, uh, like creative process where, where I don't really like being too social, which is strange because I live a very public life. Yeah. Well, I think you, um, <clears throat> obviously, like, like you say, Sometimes if you, if you do go out, you might get not a rest, but uh, you know you yeah. want to enjoy a drink by yourself and, and, and relax. Um, and 
you know, I'm, I like to have a glass of wine when, when I'm cooking and, and stuff like that, and uh, the occasional whiskey. So, um, you know, I, I know where you're coming from. <laughs> That's good. Do you, I mean, do people recognize you when you go down to the pub because you played for England and you were quite a high profile rugby player? Like, and you're, you're, I mean, you have a unique look to yourself. You've got blonde, wavy hair. You're a big guy, so people must recognize you. Yeah. Um, well, so my career started in Bedford, um, and I, I've now I've moved back to Bedford um, a few years ago. So um, a lot of people know me in in the town, and you know, I live in a small village. So so you know people know know who I am. Yeah. Um, the thing is, like you know, I can go to London and no one bat an eyelid, but um, because. But if you if you go close to Twickenham, for instance, where you know all England games are played, and people recognise you, so it depends sure. on uh, sort of which crowd you're where, where you are at the moment. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so look, like last time we, I mean, the hour went by way too fast, yeah, and uh, I, I was loving our conversation. But we were we were finishing up last week with your with your England career. Um, you were telling me about the Six Nations and how much fun that was to play. Um, in Scotland and, and kind of play all around Europe and how you guys kind of overachieved uh, during that time and how, how it was incredible. I mean, so, so you have this Six Nations and you guys, I think you finished second. Uh, yeah. You lost to Ireland, right? Yeah, no, well, it's a really, really sort of uh, close second place. And um, England actually, uh, well, a lot, a lot of teams win the tournament by... And, and still lose one game, um, so uh, it, it was just unfortunate that year that um, you know we, we we I think a different points difference, but um, soon soon after that, well, I'll say the Six Nations finished um, and uh, our domestic season continued. We uh, unfortunately got knocked out in the semi-finals, um, but um, in uh, after the domestic season finished, um, we went England went on tour to South Africa. Yeah. So, um, which was a, a unique experience for me, like you know, touring like with England back to South Africa. Um, so that was that was a you know really cool experience. Um, How was that though, being in a stadium of like thirty or forty thousand people in South Africa with the friends and the family that you grew up with, yeah. representing like representing England? Like, were you considered a traitor, or were you considered? Well, <laughs> I mean, how do people think about yeah. you in South yeah. Africa? Obviously, they're proud, but you come yeah. back with a different team. <laughs> yeah, so, um, most like because I played, um, I didn't play a high level rugby in South Africa. It was sort of a lot of people were like, you know, he's well done, he's done really well. Um, and that was the majority of the sort of feedback that I received. But, um, we played uh, um, one game in Potts of Strum, which is you know, sort of in the more rural areas of South Africa. Um, and I got a bit of abuse there, but, um, you know. Just, just you know, laugh about it. But um, yeah, it was it was a awesome experience. Um, you know, I always say that um, even though I played for play for England, that I'm I'm representing two countries in a way. I'm, I'm re representing South Africa and I'm representing England. So um, you know, to 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 line up in South Africa and and, and sing God Save the Queen was was brilliant. I, you know, it's one of the proudest moments of my life. And when the South African national anthem you know, comes on, like, you know, I'm, I'm singing along in my head. Um, and I had a, I had a like, really good, uh, the first, like, all, all the matches, well, the first two matches were really close, and the, the third one we drew, um, but all really close and, 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 you know, tough, tough uh, tour, and, you know, one which I really enjoyed, the sort of, you know, South Africans, traditionally, the Springboks play a very, very physical game, which, which I love, so um, it was nice to get stuck in against them. Oh Someone here wants to know about your place kicking. How's your how, how's your place kicking? Used to do a bit of place kicking uh, back in school. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's that, that's the end of that conversation. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> skills, the skills are there. <laughs> yeah, not bad, not bad. So, so I mean, after you finish your tour of South Africa with England, was that was that the end of your England career, and then you just went back to focus on the pro career? Uh, no, so I, I played um, one more test after that um, in the awesome test series. Um, and, uh, well, at, at the time, there was a few 
um, very talented um, young second rows coming through, um, and sort of I, I, I you know that bumped me out of my place. Um, but I, I stayed involved with England for another year, um, you know, in, in a, the training squads mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, but didn't didn't uh, play any more games. But um, you know, to go from you know amateur and semi professional to receiving ten England caps, you know, it was a dream come true and, and more than I ever could have hoped for. Yeah. Um, you know, really pleased with, with what I've achieved. Amazing, amazing. And and so I mean, so you're you're finished with England, but you're still playing pro. I mean, when yeah. did the idea of coaching come into come into your mind because you know as your career starts going you know as you get older I mean it just happens to everyone like when do you start like planning what happens next because so many players don't do this very well yeah, and yeah. and one of the things that people don't understand is is like you know there might be 30 guys on a rugby team or, or, or 25 guys on a rugby team with 15 15 players playing yeah. um, and then the rest in reserves but there's only like four maybe three or four or five coaches. So, you know, transitioning from retiring as a player to getting one of those really, really few coaching spots is really hard. I mean, I have friends in basketball who, who try to do this all the time and, and it's, uh, it's, it's just so few and far between. Yeah. So how did you transition? Um, it wasn't until the last couple of years in, um, while I was playing that I, that I actually you know, decided I want to go into coaching. Although, even though when I when I um, I studied sports management and coaching in South Africa um, before I came over over to the UK, um, it wasn't until until quite near the end of my career that I decided I wanted to become a coach. Um, so for the last two seasons that I was coaching, I coached at the university, um, Durham University um, in in uh, in Durham, and then. Um, when I when I retired, um, so I had a forced retirement um, because of a concussion, um, and at the time, you know, it sort of felt like you know it was inevitable. So I started um, reaching out, and um, I spoke to a, a guy that I played with who was playing for Germany at the time, um, and he put me in touch with the coach, and I, you know, started a dialogue with the coach, and. Um, they invited me to come over and observe them in a training camp, um, which was really good. I was really impressed with the, the program and what they were doing. Um, and um, after that, they, they invited me to, to join the coaching staff, which was brilliant. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I coached in Germany for about two years um, with, the, with a, sort of the leading club side and the national team and with both teams we in, achieved sort of incredible success um so um personally like really successful first two years of coaching um and i was really pleased and that there was a there was actually there's quite a few south africans in the um they're the, everywhere they're the, everywhere yeah uh, a lot mm -hmm. of a lot of them that qualified through ancestry um so it was a, you know, a, a great group of people, and um, you know, still very close with a lot of them, and um, you know, still keep in touch, and uh, some great memories uh, along the way. Do you, uh, do you mind? Do you mind if we just drop back a little bit and talk about your concussion and 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 yeah. uh, and kind of how that forced you out of the game? And and because you know, a lot of people they know that rugby is a very physical game, um, and obviously, you know, your head, you know, heads hit each other and parts of bodies and stuff like that. And, and sometimes people wear helmets, like these little small helmets, sometimes people don't. Um, so, you know, what, what was your history with, with head injuries and how did that kind of lead up to you deciding to, to leave or, or being forced to leave? Yeah, um, I, I had a few uh, concussions during my career. Um, and the last, the last two I had, um, one was in 2013 and one was in 2014. Um, you know, both after those two concussions, I, I, I spent, I think, two weeks and three weeks on the sidelines with symptoms and recovering. Um, and then I had a period of uh, at least two or three years without any concussions. Um, and then 
I had a, a, a very mild concussion. Um, you know, I played on, uh, it would happen sort of five minutes before, before half time. And I played on, um, you know, so I felt fine. And it wasn't until half time that I just didn't feel right. Um, and I said to the, to the, to the doctor, that, you know, I, I don't feel right. Um, and at the time, it was a lot more sort of stricter protocols coming in place. Um, so he, he said, you know, you can't carry on if you don't feel right. So um, came off at halftime and um, that was that was the end. Um, I, um, you know, that, that was a Saturday. Um, I, was, I was fine after that for uh, I think 24, 48 hours. And then after that, you start your return to play protocol. So you do a, a very light um, sort of, bike session for 20 minutes um not getting your heart rate above i think 70 percent um and then for the next 24 hours if you don't don't have any symptoms you go on to the next stage and i think there's six or seven stages for a return to play and then every stage obviously if there's no symptoms then then you you, you can go on to the next stage um and i i failed my last stage continuously um or every time um, it was a it was a test, um, like a online test that you had to do, um, and I and I kept failing the test. Um, and then after heavy weight sessions, I would get symptoms again, um, you know, through the pressure going into your head. Um, and so the the club sent me to a neurologist, um, and I went for a test and and everything, and you know they couldn't really find anything. Um, you know, I think the brain is such a complicated thing and, you know, something that we know so little about. Um, but I, th I think at one stage, they, they, they through the test that I did, uh, memory test, they, they think they stumbled upon something. Um, and they, they they said that, you know, I think that's, that's sort of a marker for us. Um, so they um, advised me to, to, um, to retire. And even though they couldn't really find something, I, I, I always, well, after the concussion, after the reoccurring sort of symptoms, I, I knew something was wrong and, and, and I knew, I, I didn't think I was going to re recover because, you know, even for 18 months after my retirement, I still kept having symptoms. Um, after what what we, kinds of symptoms were you having? Because I, I don't think a lot of people in the, you know, who are watching this or who will watch this later have been concussed. And, yeah. and it's a huge issue in sports now because, you know, in American football or in ice hockey, like people used to get concussed and then just take some smelling salts and go back out onto the field. And, yeah. and, and, you know, now obviously people are so much more careful, but still there's no, no one really knows how or why people get concussed and then how or why they recover quickly or don't. Like there's yeah. just, the science is just baffling. And, mm -hmm. and I, like, what kinds of symptoms were you getting? Um, it was sort of a for, 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 for the beginning. It was sort of a just sort of a misty feeling in my in my head. Um, almost, almost at, at times, almost felt like I was a bit congested. Um, okay. And then it went to sort of uh, feeling hungover. Um, at times, I was very sensitive to light. I, I know at one stage, um, you know, I was literally locked in my bedroom for about three or four days everything completely blacked out and dark and you know just basically slept for almost four days um and i was on um i can't remember the, the tablets but it's uh like for i think sort of um like neuro neurological um painkillers or whatever um and i was and it's also it was also antidepressants um and i was on, I was on that and I, you were supposed to take one or two a, a day or something. And I and I spoke to the, to the club doctor, and it's like, no, how many are you taking? I was like, I think I took six the other day. And like, it's like, you know, people that take six would, would, would pass out. I'm like, well, I was I was I was fine actually. Okay. But, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so the symptoms vary, but um, you know, some some can be very mild, like like I said, like a, you know, you feel a bit congested, to you know, pounding headaches, and you know, you can't. Be in light so it, it varies and um 
I think everyone experiences differently. And like I said, the um, the concussion that I had, the last concussion, which forced me to retire, you know, was was sort of very mild. Um, you know, I, I didn't expect anything like that to to happen. So, like I said, the the brain is a very complicated thing, and you know, we know very little about it. And um, you know, every everyone experiences different things. So, um, yeah. Very difficult. No, so how did it how did it feel when you had to announce your retirement? Um, like I said, it was sort of I felt that it was coming because like I I didn't feel right. I didn't feel like I could go back to playing. Um and when I when I sort of started thinking that, you know, I'm not sure if I can make make, make the recovery, I um I reached out to to um the the coach in Germany and um and sort of try and try and try and line something up for myself, which I did, um, which was good um, to, to find something to, to go into straight away. Um, I believe, I believe if you didn't make that straight transition, it would have been a lot harder. Like yeah. having that, having like six months of nothing, yeah. that would have been, that would have been like way too many nights down at the pub kind of stuff. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's definitely, it's definitely important to keep, um, you know, busy well busy yeah uh, and, and 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 also active um like coming up professional rugby your body's so used to, to 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 training every day almost that it's important to to find something else to to put your energy into um like I said, your body's used to it and, and there's a lot of uh you know hormones that that comes with it like you know with, with exercise can feel feel good hormones um, and there's a lot of people going to depression after retiring, um, and a lot of them always say that exercise helps. So it's um, it's important to stay active and find something else to to do in, in terms of staying active and training. Yeah, no, it's true. I I dealt with my depression and my end of, the end of my college career uh, by going to China and just just totally going into like something completely different just to keep you know just to change my entire mindset because yeah. I didn't want to, I didn't want to hang around and be like the guy that used to play. Like I just wanted to go to the moon and, and try to live a, a totally different life. That's kind of yeah. how I, I envisioned the next chapter of my, of my career. So when you went to Germany, were you like second row coach? Were you like, what, what, what kind of coaching level did you come in at? And, 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 and how, I mean, how did that, I mean, obviously you had two great years in Germany, but what what coaching were you actually doing? Um, so, like I said, for, for the last two years while I was playing, I was coaching at the university side. Um, so I coached the uh, the defence um, and also the, the forwards, um, the forward play, lineouts and scrums, um, general forward play, and then also team defence. Um, and that's what I did with Germany as well. Um, I, and I was lucky at the time uh, the head coach. And the other assistant coach were, you know, they were great guys, and they, they sort of gave me, in a way, quite a bit of free reign. Um, so I was able to come in and and, and make a few changes, um, and sort of, you know, run with a few ideas, which was nice. Um, and um, and like I said, we, we did really well. Um, yeah, yeah, for the first for the first two years, um, the last the last two campaigns we had we had um, different head coach come in and um, he so, um, coached me at England actually so uh, he was the defence coach when I was playing for England. Um, Mike Ford is now coaching at Leicester, um, and then he came in um, at to Germany and he was the head coach at Germany, um, which was really nice for me um, to to learn from someone. Uh, who coached at such a such a high level? Um, you know, it really helped me with sort of structuring my my training sessions and, and stuff like that. So, you know, my 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 knowledge going into coaching was was very technical. Um, you know, I, I knew how to do certain things on the field, and I and I could transfer transfer that knowledge to to the players. Um, but sort of the last the last sort of eighteen months. Um, the coaches that I worked with really helped me to, with my with my coaching and with my, you know how how I speak to the team and how I get my information across to the players. They really helped me with that. Whereas, um, you know, my first eighteen months, 
you know, I, I just did it my way and got I got the information across. But I think I, I'm much more effective at doing that now, um, having had the having worked with um, two very experienced coaches now. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what's your current coaching role that you have today? Um, I'm coaching in at Amtil Rugby Club in in England. Um, we play in the Championship, which is the the, the, the sort of the, the second tier in England, um, just under the Premiership. Um, and uh, the team the team was promoted last season into the Championship, um, so it was their first season in the Championship, and um, not many people gave us a chance. And uh, we had a fantastic season. Um, finishing fifth in in the league, um, you know, behind some really big clubs and you know, teams with huge budgets. So um, again, a, a really good achievement, and you know, really proud of what what the guys achieved this year. So amazing, amazing. So what 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 is the rugby season for professionals in the United Kingdom from when to when? Um, it normally, st- so well, the season starts normally in September and finishes. Um, sort of in the April, and if you didn't go into the playoffs, you will play for the semi-finals and the finals in May. Um, so this, this like this cut your season. This cut the whole end of the season off, essentially. Yeah. So with with the championship, they 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 cancel the season. The season was finished, so oh, wow. uh, they use uh, some some sort of. Um, Mathematic, mathematical calculation to to work out the tables for the rest of the season in, in in the every league below the Premiership. Um, the Premiership, the Premiership, they are looking to restart uh, on the fifteenth of August, um, and they want to finish their season. Um, so they you're gonna they if all goes well, they'll finish this season, and then you know have a have a bit of a break, and then then start the the new season after that okay wow so okay let's take a break from rugby for a sec so i mean one of the reasons why i wanted to talk to you is because i i mean i follow you on instagram and you are always outside and you know you live in a small village in the uk but you're always outside you're an outdoorsman um you know tell me more about this because i love the great outdoors as well and i find it a great way to kind of balance yeah. with the stress of 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 being uh, in television and being, you know, having to work um, so much. Like, where where did your ideas of, of spending time outside come from and how have they kind of progressed through your career? Yeah. So, growing up in South Africa, I grew up uh, in, in very rural areas. Um, and my dad is always a keen outdoorsman, hunter, fisherman. Um, and that's, that's how I grew up. Um, you know, we lived in in Namibia for for a while, um, and in also in Northern Cape. So it's, it's very sort of arid areas, of farming communities. Um, my dad was headmaster, so every hunting season he would get a few invites from from parents who, whose children go to school uh, to come hunting, and um, you know we would always go along. Um, and I think I was sixteen or around there one and then you know I shot my first springbok um and we also had, had sheep growing up so you know we, we were in a very small town and it was you know there was one general store um but you know most people would buy whole sheep and would process it themselves um sure. and we had sheep and you know every few weeks we would bring one home slaughter it process it and put in the freezer and that was, you know, our meat. And in the hunting season, we would have spring box um, and we would process it ourselves and, and, and cut it up and, and, and put it in the freezer. Um, what's, a, what's a spring box, spring box for people who might not be from yeah. South Africa or be watching, you know, rugby in South Africa? Because obviously, yeah. I mean, what is that? It's like a deer? Yeah, I mean, you know, you would know a pronghorn antelope. Yeah, with the it's it's it looks very similar and and the the horns uh, are very similar shape as well. So that's probably for um, people in Canada and, and the USA very very much look like a pronghorn antelope. Okay. Uh, so oh, just one sec here. So Thomas is asking you, uh, hey Mo, fantastic player. Oh great, he's a fan. Uh, do you have any aspirations to coach at the international level? 
would you hope to coach England or overseas? And then I'll get back to your hunting. Um, yeah, definitely have aspirations. Um, like I'm coaching in a championship now, so you know the next steps for me would be to try and coach in a premiership or in a professional league um, somewhere. Um, and you know, I definitely have uh, aspirations to to coach at the highest level um, and highest level internationally as well. Awesome, awesome stuff. So, is I mean, uh, growing up in Canada, like people hunt a lot in Canada. Yeah. And, and, and in the United States as well, it's, it's a big deal. And, yeah. um, and in North America, like there's hunting seasons for certain animals because the animals are overpopulated yeah. and kind of doing damage to the natural flora and fauna. So people kind of need to go out and hunt these animals. Is, yeah. it, is it similar in South Africa? Um, I, th I think probably less so. So South Africa, it's, it's I think in a way nowadays it's, it's, it's more commercial um so you know f farms are, are fenced um all over south africa and um uh, so in a lot of areas people farm you know sheep or cattle but they also have um antelope um you know for themselves most of the time and, and they have friends that would come hunt with them or they would you know once a year they would have a, a few hunters in and, and they would pay to come come shoot and so that's it bit of a, an extra income um i've seen that in antarctica uh, i've seen that not in antarctica i've seen that in argentina i was yeah. filming in argentina and they had a, a hunting lodge and it was a fenced in property where they bred uh their own deer and yeah. um and had them grazing out on this massive like 150 acre or 250 acre property and it was beautiful with mountains and forests and they would take hunting parties out to to yeah. go hunting and then you would learn how to process uh your your kill and then you would also eat it and uh, maybe take it home with you i think yeah yeah, yeah. yeah south africa is the same like um it's the farms are huge because it's you know it's, it's such a dry country in, in a lot of areas the farms are huge and you know just just the antelope roam and, and you know they, it's not like they caged in um it's huge huge properties um and again like you know People go hunting, and they would then take the meat home with them to to process and eat. It's you know that's that's how I grew up. You, know, you wouldn't just shoot something for for the sake of it. So you would harvest it and you would process it and you would eat it. Um, and you know those skills that I learned as a, as a kid growing up. Uh, you know I, I, I still still love doing it now. Um, What's it like hunting in What's it like hunting in England? Is it is it allowed, or are you, do you have to get a lot more different permits? No, I mean it's 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 just brilliant, really, because it's quite unique. There's 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 a lot. I mean, there's the most deer ever in England that's the, that's ever been there. So it's um, probably a little bit overpopulated, and um, you know it needs managing um, all over the country, um, and there's you know, there's um, a few alien species in, in, in England as well, which have taken off really well. And, and you know, they also cause a lot of damage. Um, but, you know, you, you'd, you'd see a lot of sort of, say, deer roadkill um, because there's a lot of deer um, and they roam everywhere in England. You know, you could drive in the countryside and you would at the right time of the day of day. And if you know where to look, you'd see one. So. Um, yeah, there's a lot of deer around and um it's it's nice to to be out in the countryside and be able to pursue those hobbies and you know bring the bring the, the meat home and process it myself and you know make burgers and sausages and barbecue cuts and, and you know meatballs for the kids um you know that that's that's something i really enjoy doing and it's um it's it's you know I'm very privileged to be able to to to, to do that amazing so what other outdoor activities do you like to do? Yeah, you ever go hiking or climbing or trekking or camping or anything like that? Um, yeah, camping. I, I like to take my, 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 my son camping um, as much as I can when the weather's nice. Um, I, 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 watch, uh, I like to watch um, survival programs. Um, yeah. something, something I would like to try one day. Um, running, running wild with Bear grills. you should do it. Yeah, I've watched that. Um, they... they I'm not sure if it's still still going, but they used to have uh, Bear Grylls the Island, yeah, uh, which was really good to watch. Um, 
and in America, I think it's American program, Naked and Afraid, which yeah. is also good to watch. But um, I, I love I love stuff like that. Um, you know, I'm not sure if I would last very long, but it's um, it's nice to uh, sort of think about stuff like that. You know, I, I grew up, like I said, very rurally. My brother and I used to pack backpacks in the morning and head out, and you know, we'd take a rifle with us and like go out for the day and and make fire and cook our meat and so you know had a very sort of free spirited uh um childhood okay wow that's beautiful i mean it's it, it's 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 just like a, you know a life that is just kind of more simple like it's just kind of you know it's it's the way we all lived at a time right and and yeah. it's kind of and those skills have kind of all been forgotten yeah i, I saw something something this week on, on television they um they discovered um, an arrowhead made from bone, which uh, is 60,000 years old. Wow. So that's, you know, for the last 60,000 years, 62,000 years, you know, they've, they've been, our ancestors have been, hunt, been hunting. Um, and it's, it's, it's just nice to, it's, it's, I grew up doing it, but it's also nice to know where your food comes from. Like, you know, you don't know where everything comes from in the supermarket and what's been injected into it and everything. So uh, it's, it's, it's nice to, to know where everything comes from as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a, there's a podcaster in the United States I listen to. He's also a stand up comedian. His name is um, Joe Rogan. He's quite yeah. famous. Yeah. And uh, he does, he does bow hunting and he hunts elk. So yeah. every, every elk season, he's like up in Montana and uh, the northern part of the USA, and he and he hunts um, whatever the maximum number of elk he can hunt. I think it's like two or three, but he he processes them at a local butcher, and then brings the meat back to Los Angeles where he lives, freezes them, and yeah. then he and then he and his family basically eat elk meat uh, for the whole year. And and he's really big on this because he says like elk meat is one of the the healthiest. Um, animal meats you can eat and i and i, I don't know if that's 100 percent true i'm not a doctor but he the, you know he's done the research and this is kind of what he suggests and and he lives by it and he loves yeah. it uh and it's nice to see you know people who still you know engage with those skills because you know as we can tell our our society is a little bit fragile and if it all goes to shit you'll still be able to hunt and provide for your family yeah i mean just before the lockdown <laughs> i was able to get out and and and, and um and, and harvest a, a deer or two. So, um, you know, we had some meat in the freezer, which was nice. Um, no, if, the super, if the supermarket isn't open, um, oh, I'm done. Like, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I am, you know, I'll just, I'll just be here, you know, starving. I'm totally useless. I can barely cook. It's, it's not, not, a, not a strong existence. I do love being outside and yeah. I love camping and trekking, but, you know, normally we're eating, you know, camping food out of bags where you just add water. Yeah. Or if we're out with like a proper caravan and we're on an expedition, and we've got someone cooking, you know, maybe they're making a little bit of local food, but it's not, not much. And, um, but if I had to go out and actually hunt for myself, I've never fired a gun and I can't remember the last time I used a bow and arrow, but I'm rubbish. I can tell you that. Yeah. Um, no, I've, I've seen, I've seen Joe Rogan on uh, meat eater before. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty awesome what he does, and uh, and awesome what you do as well. I mean, so I mean, when are you gonna be? When are you gonna get out and do your next hunt? Um, well, we've we've got um, you know, a few more meals in the freezer. So uh, once we start running low, I'll I'll, I'll plan another trip out. But um, and do you, do you go out by yourself or do you go out with a friend? Um, I'm I'm lucky enough to to have so in England it works like this. So um, Obviously, you get your um, license to to um, to buy a, a rifle, um, and and for that you have to go through you know quite a, st a strict process, um, and once you're approved, you you're able to purchase a, a, a rifle, um, and then you know you can pay people to go and shoot with them, um, or if you get an open license, you you know if, if you have ground that you can shoot on, then you can shoot on the ground. And um, I've been lucky enough to to um, know a few farmers, local farmers, um, and then they give you permission to shoot on their land. Um, and I've been I'm lucky enough to to have a bit of ground that I that I can go out and and and, and, and hunt on. And do you go out on foot? Or are you on a, like a, a four wheeler or a motorcycle? Like 
like how do you get how do you get to where the good hunting is like i'm totally naive when it's 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 can we can we go together if i come to england will you take me out yeah definitely it's um i mean like i said deer, there's deer everywhere in england and if you if you know where to look then there's there's a lot of deer and so we were sat in the back garden the other the other day and behind my house i've got a, a field which is planted now with peas and um we were sat in um, by the by the fire, and there was a it was a deer in the field, which was which was nice to see. But um, you know, I'm I can walk to 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 where I I I, I hunt. So, but I drive there because you know you don't want to be walking with a, a rifle over your shoulder down the street. No. Uh, so I, I drive there, and then you know I, I, you just walk on foot. It's 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 you know a few 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 miles walk that you a few miles that you cover throughout the the walk. Or the, the store. Very nice, very nice. So, so um, have you ever? I've got a question for you. I was doing some research the other day. You, did you know that there's like a 380 kilometer trail that goes across England? On the narrowest point in England, you can walk like from one side to the other, from from sea to sea. Uh, no, I didn't know that. See, I'm doing because I'm I'm trying to figure out a way to come and hang out. Uh, and, and try to get to the UK to do um, some filming, but um, but I've been looking for some adventures, and I bet I bet I bet that's prime hunting territory as well. <laughs> and, uh, um, no, I mean there's a lot of uh, good. Well, I think there's some good hikes uh, around England, um, especially if you go further up north. There's um, a lot of sort of mountainous terrain where where a lot of people go 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 hiking. Yeah, definitely, and of course, Scotland is just a gem of of outdoor adventure and hiking and trekking yeah. as well. Do you, yeah. you ever head up to Scotland? I've been I've been a couple of times, um, mostly for for rugby. Um, not not you know, we actually we went for one weekend with the family. We stayed in a in a, in a um, log cabin um, near Dumfries in Scotland, which was really nice. Um, you know, it was we just took our bicycles and. Um, had a bit of it was, a, it was a sort of cycling trail, um, so at the little one, only only had one one kid at a time, so he was on the, on my bike, and um, yeah, it was good to you know there's some bicycle trails, so we had a cycle around, and you know we'd have a barbecue in the evening by the by the log cabin, which is really nice, beautiful, uh, beautiful. In the middle midst of winter, but um, you know when you get a clear day in Scotland, it's um, yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. It is. It is. I was staying. I went up. I went up to Speyside, and I stayed at a place called the Muck Rack Hotel, which is actually a hunter's lodge. And and it was kind of it was split between the people who were there. There were people there for hunting, and I can't remember what they were hunting. And then there were people like me who were there just to visit all the distilleries. So I went and did the whole whiskey uh, whiskey tours out of the Muck Rack Lodge, and it was funny because people were go out in the morning with guns and people would go out in the morning with their drivers and then do all these tastings. Cause obviously you can't drive uh, yourself around or else yeah. it would be terrible. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not much uh, of that happening in the UK. So you know, everything is nice and close, close together. And uh, you know, if you have to, you just jump in a taxi and you're, you're, oh. you're where you want to go. So um, yeah, yeah no, some, some, some pretty good uh, whiskey spots in, in Scotland as well. You, know, like, you, you like your whiskey, so you should uh, you should pop pop by. I will for sure. I will. So, um, so look, you mentioned that your season has been cancelled as a coach, uh, and they've created some mathematical formula to decide who won the season and and what place everyone finished, which is just terrible. Uh, that must be such a soul destroying way to finish after working so hard. But how? How is it? How is it for you right now, getting your coaching staff and your players? Kind of mentally focused for maybe starting training again in July, or or you know, like how is that how is that progressing at the moment? Yeah. I mean, it's so so top level um, in the Premiership players players are back in training now in in small groups. Uh, so are you are you are you are you putting the players through their paces like during Monday to Friday? No, um, like. Stay there with a, a couple of a um, couple of um, like fitness trainers. Um, it's only some fitness trainers. About the coaches are still all all, all the way. There's no there's no actual rugby going on yet. It's it's just uh, sort of uh, getting the fitness levels up again. 
um, until until restrictions allow sort of let's say more interaction. Um, but you know, I, th I think for the for the players, uh, it, it was probably it's probably a really tough. Um, yeah, sort of not knowing when almost the call is going to come, like you know, but all, always being ready, like you know, maintaining your fitness and and, and sort of at snap, you know, at the drop the hat to, to sort of jump back into it really. And uh, it's and, impossible to stay match fit forever. No, no, definitely, definitely won't stay match fit. And um, before they they would play, they I think there will be at least a four week um training period to to get them sort of match fit again and and they get their bodies conditioned um to take contact again is that enough four weeks yeah yeah i think four weeks four weeks fine we we used to have um a four week pre-season um and then we would start our friendly matches so yeah i think i think that that's sufficient um and most teams would be would be comfortable comfortable with that because so much of rugby is timing, and, and it's not just timing, like, you know, it's, it's timing about how to hit people and how to be hit, right? Because, like, you know how to shield yourself and protect yourself, and you know how to, like, not just get absolutely destroyed by the guy running at you. Um, but, I mean, like, obviously, with so many months off, and, and maybe only, I, I'm just worried about, like, injuries. Like, people, like, like the, the football teams are getting back right now, and I'm just worried about all these, like, highly tuned athletes like blowing ACLs and Achilles tendons and or just getting not being ready to take contact like you said and just getting hurt um, because this is you know this whole layoff and the way people are you know going to be getting back into this is is something we've never dealt with before no um, definitely but um, you know I think I think for the guys at top level it's a bit like you know riding a bike it's uh, not something something you, you forget I think you just need to get the the muscles used to to cycling again and, and used to the contact again. Um, you know, as, as a rugby player, um, the first time you take contact, which would be now would be training sessions. Um, you know, it, it's it's a bit of a shock to the body. Not, I'd say it's not a shock in the training session, but you know, you be you for quite a few days afterwards, you'd be really sore. Um, so it's 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 getting the body. Um, Used to used to those contacts again, and then you know, as your body gets used to it, your re recovery time will be quicker. So um, you know, once the body is conditioned in, in a way where where it's comfortable, like within three days, you should not really have that much um, you know soreness in the muscles and stuff like that. Whereas you know, for for the first session or something like that, you will be sore for about a week probably afterwards. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, and what and what does that four weeks of training look like? Are those two a days? Are those you know one practice a day? Like, how hard can you push a rugby player in his prime um, so, to get ready for a season? Yeah, so most most teams would probably train four four days a week, okay. um, which be, you know used to be so sort of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays off, Thursday, Friday, and then two days off, um, and then. You do probably four four gym sessions in a week. Um, you do say uh, upper body Monday, lower body Tuesday, and then the same on on, on Thursday and Friday. Um, and then and would you do that before the practice or after practice? Yeah, no, normally before. Um, yeah, same in basketball. Yeah, I've experienced as a player, um, and if you after, if after practice, practice, you're just wasted. Yeah, it's it's difficult to to put any effort into the gym after a field session, whereas it's it's after a gym session, it's 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 easier to put more into a, a field session. Um, but yeah, normally they would do a gym session and then um, followed by a skill session. Or so say that the forwards would do skill session, they would go gym, the backs would gym first, and then you would swap around, and then you'll have a, a break, and then you'd have your your tough field session after that so um you know with your running uh, and sort of maybe contact component to it um and then your tuesday before the wednesday off will be harder and your friday will be again harder than your thursday so you, you you can have that day and two days to recover from that training session yeah so 
you know, one of the things I've been really interested in is just like how people are mentally dealing with not being as active as we're used to. And I mean, you're a coach, you're a former professional athlete, a national team level athlete. Like what's it, I mean, what's it been like just being home and hanging out for three months? I mean, normally, you know, you live a pretty exciting life. Like you're training, you know, you're, you're coaching at an elite level, you're working with elite athletes, you know, people all around the, the UK and Europe are watching your teams play. Um, yeah. And now you're just kind of, you know, sitting at home and hanging out with the kids and what, you know, wife, which is good. But like, I mean, you must miss that adrenaline of competition, yeah. even at the coaching level. Yeah, no, definitely. It's, um, it's definitely something, something we miss. Um, I think in the beginning of the lockdown, uh, I did a lot of, gardening and I planted a lot of vegetables <laughs> I did quite a few uh, DIY projects yeah fix the uh, garage paint the you know paint yeah. the paint the garage or fix the roof yeah um but um I've, I've, I've tried to speak to a lot of other rugby coaches um and try and learn try and, and, and try and connect um I've, I've been lucky to speak to quite a few very good coaches over the last few weeks um, I spoke to um, the current England coach Eddie Jones earlier this week, which is really nice. And I spoke to um, Matt Proudford. Um, he was the South African Fords coach when they won the World Cup, and is now the current England Ford coach. Um, so I've yeah, been connecting with other coaches and speaking to them, and um, it's nice to sort of stay active and keep keep learning as well. Um, and it's, you know when you speak to other coaches and you find out how they do do things um and you know what they do um and you learn from from their experience as well so and you exchange ideas um so that's been you know well how i've been trying to keep busy um sort of analyzing rugby games you know not even my own games my team team's games but other teams games just to just to learn and 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 uh sort of be more prepared next time next time or well, when we get back to normality yeah awesome awesome well is there anything that we haven't talked about that you wanted to mention or or promote or anything that's going on that that uh that we that we skipped over maybe um i don't think so um we like i said did a lot of uh vegetable planting and stuff and um it's how's your co how's your cooking how would your how would your family rate your cooking? If I if we brought each of them onto onto the screen and was like, what do you think of your dad's cooking to one of your sons or your wife? Like, what would they? Uh, how would they? How would they see you? No, I, I, I think probably quite highly. Hopefully, um, like I, I love cooking, and um, you know, I, I probably do the majority of the cooking in the house. Um, but saying that, it's Father's Day, so um, my wife's busy. Uh, Busy doing her bit and uh, you know looking forward to a nice dinner tonight, three course meals. So. Oh, fantastic, fantastic! Yeah. At least, and are, are the kids behaving uh, today? It's like, come on, guys, it's Father's Day. Just give me one day. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're not too bad. Um, yeah, we went out uh, earlier this morning and, and uh, popped to my um, my wife's dad, and uh, you know we were stood outside, and you know he, he's inside and if you way through the window and and, and talk to him. So. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it was nice for him to see that see the grandkids um and see you see his daughter on father's day and um yeah but no kids kids have been behaving and um the little one's having a nap now so he'll be up in a bit um and then i'll have to run after them again and what about your own parents in south africa have you reached out yeah and no, i spoke to them early this morning um yeah and well i speak to them sort of most days and uh you know the luxury of a uh, video call um, I remember when I first came to England, like I would, um, every Friday after work, I would go to um, the, the telephone box uh, with a whole, you know, handful of coins, coins um, and I would um, have a um, an access number that you dial before you dial the, the, the number, um, because, you know, that, that it would only be three or four pence a minute or something like that, so... Um, you know, there was ways to cheat the system. <laughs> I remember, I remember traveling around in China in like 2001, and I remember like once every week or so I would try to call my 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 family, my parents, and I and this was like you know, 
email was like still a new thing. And yeah. I remember, yeah, going to the phone booth in China and having to dial in an international code and then just plow in a whole bunch. I had to go with a pocket full of coins um, just to get through like a one or two minute phone call. It was unbelievable. Thomas, Thomas here is asking you uh, what you think of the Saracens situation and what the future holds for them. What is the, what is the situation that you're talking about? Um, yeah, quite complicated. Um, so f- we only we only have about three more minutes left. So you, if you can condense it, this is a, this is a salary salary cap in uh, in rugby and in the Premiership, okay. um, and um, through some uh, sort of sideline investment with the players, uh, which they thought uh, was legal. Um, it was classed as not being legal, so they've been over the salary cap for the last few years. Um, so they have been, so they were deducted 35 points um, at uh, one stage in the season, um, and then they were doing really well, and they were going to look like they were going to survive um, relegation, um, and then they were handed another 35 point deduction. So they've been. So they've been relegated, or they will be relegated um, in the season to the championship. So um, we, well, our team will be playing against Saracens, which which, which would be pretty cool. But um, you know, it's 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 really sad what has happened. Um, you know, and I feel for everyone involved at at the at the club. Um, but I do think that uh, the the team and the club will come back stronger than ever. Um, you know, they they will have a whole season next season where they will will sort of blood youngsters um, and give them great great uh, a lot of playing time. Uh, and when they get back into the Premiership, all those guys who are now coming through the system will have more experience and will have a lot more game time behind them. And uh, you know, I think they will come back stronger than before. So um, you know, it's uh, it's going to be an exciting few years for them. Okay. Wow. It's. Uh... It's crazy how the financiers and the bankers can uh, just destroy a rugby team. I suppose. Mm-hmm. Who who knows, man? It's uh, it's tricky once people start playing with numbers, isn't it? Yeah, it's, you know, I, it's, I don't think it's any black or, or at the time there wasn't any black or white, and um, you know, someone someone uh, made a judgment that it wasn't right. So uh, it's just one of those things, unfortunately. So, so how many more weeks until you guys are back training? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure of, in terms of our team. Um, it might be uh, probably another month or so before before we all resume training. Um, we the, the, the Premiership teams are sort of in training again in small groups and then sort of little households. They 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 training. Back into training, and I think as so as the restrictions, the lockdown restrictions ease, um, their training will, um, will, will will become more intense. Okay, awesome, buddy, awesome. Well, look, if I can get to the UK to do some filming, uh, I would like to catch up for yeah. for a for a pint at the pub, or maybe come and watch one of your games if you guys are playing. Definitely. And um, and I just want to thank you so much for your time and uh, sharing everything in your life. You know, from your early days to your playing career to your coaching career to your love of the outdoors and and really everything in between it's been uh enlightening and exactly. uh and th- thank you for that no thank you for having me it's been uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, yeah nice nice talking to you yeah and i look forward to staying in touch and i will i will call on you in the near future so, so, no, so be ready for it <laughs> brilliant brian nice to talk to you okay thanks buddy happy father's day enjoy your dinner tonight <laughs> thank your thank your wife no worries. Thank you, mate. Take care. Bye-bye. Yes. Okay, guys. That was my second conversation with Mo Botha, uh, the rugby player, England national, professional rugby coach, professional rugby player. Um, just, wow, what a awesome insight into such a talent, uh, talented and passionate uh, rugby professional. I mean, the amount of people I've had the chance to talk to through these COVID calls and the amount that I've learned about other people's lives has been wonderful. And, uh, and today we got, we got Mo's life and, and his love of the outdoors and, and his rugby career and, and also his, 
his issue with concussions and how it eventually ended his career. So thank you, Mo, for your time. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. I really love doing these calls, and I hope you're all enjoying them. Take care. Stay safe. Bye-bye, guys.